Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Alumni Weekend with Hopkins at Home. It's a great pleasure to be here talking to you today. My name is Konstantin Liketsos. I go by Costas, and I run the Johns Hopkins Memory and Alzheimer's Treatment Center. I spend my professional time involved in understanding and treating people who have Alzheimer's and related disorders. My job today is uh, to give you a quick overview about where we are in select areas that relate to my field. So I will begin by giving you an overview. I will be talking very briefly about each of these topics, and I've chosen them because they are pretty current, because they tend to provoke questions, and so I'm hoping to get a good conversation going during the Q&A. So I'll be talking about public health impact, a few definitions, I'll explain the term biomarkers and what they mean. I'll talk about a pre-symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's where it's going on in the brain without any symptoms. I'll talk about the importance of neuropsychiatric or behavioral symptoms to taking care of people with dementia. And then I'll show you a bit of evidence about how home-based care that we're developing at Hopkins is making big advances in improving quality of life. I'll close then with talking about precision medicine which is the future research that we're doing and many others to develop new therapies, remind you about cognitive reserve, and I'll leave you with a slide where we talk about what to do now. Now, this might seem a lot, but I think you will find that it all ties well together and that it will get you thinking about a number of issues. Public health impact. What this basically means, as this slide shows, is that there is a very large number of people with dementia, Alzheimer's, and related disorders living in the United States and worldwide, and that every 20 years, just by aging of the population, the numbers double. So as you see in this slide, we are at 2020. On a worldwide basis, we believe there are about 50 million people alive with Alzheimer's or a related disorder. By 2040, that number will double to close to 100 million. And by 2050, the number will uh, become even higher to close to 120 million people alive with dementia throughout the world. The average person with dementia today lives eight to 12 years. So you can imagine that this is not just a single snapshot, but this is an enduring effect of having that many people living with dementia and by consequence, the cost to the United States by 2050 is estimated to be a trillion dollars per year in the USA. Of course, given the current era of how trillion dollars are being spent, this might not be a very big number, I say with air quotes. Let me go over a few definitions. A question that I always get is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So I will very quickly use an analogy from heart disease and get you uh, your thinking going in that regard. So in heart disease, we talk about chest pain. It's a symptom that everybody has sometimes every day and usually is nonspecific and not important. Angina is a constellation of symptoms that are very specific. It can involve chest pain, chest pain that goes down the back or down the arm, nausea, dizziness, and that's what we call a syndrome. It's a constellation of symptoms. Uh, this can be due to something called congestive heart failure where the heart is failing in its pump function and therefore people get angina. And the underlying cause of this in the heart itself could be disease of the coronary arteries. So we go from nonspecific symptom to syndrome to a broader syndrome to artery disease. The same in my field, we have memory loss. Raise your hand if you've not had memory loss today about something. I, I don't think I see anyone raising their hand. It's a very common symptom that we all have, but only when it's part of a constellation of other problems that it's affecting functioning, either mildly or severely, do we have something called mild cognitive impairment, mild behavioral impairment, or this condition called dementia. 
And the most common cause in the brain is Alzheimer's disease. So notice all of these concepts above the dotted line are descriptions of what's happening in the patient. Below the dotted line is telling us what's going on in the organ, whether it be the heart or the brain. Why is this important? Well, it's important because we can diagnose dementia very well with clinical tests. And this is something called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, something that was popularized by President Trump when he was challenged by it many moons ago. This test basically is a clinical test to quantify whether someone is cognitively impaired and the MOCA in the right setting can decide yes or no, whether someone has dementia or a milder condition. You don't need an MRI, you don't need a blood test to tell you whether someone has dementia. On the other hand, whether someone has Alzheimer's disease, you need a biologic test that looks inside the brain. And here's an example of something called a PET scan, which is imaging the amount of amyloid in the brain of people with Alzheimer's on the top or normal older people. And what you can see with the red patches here is that these Alzheimer's patients have a lot of amyloid. These are the proteins that we believe are involved in the development of the dementia. So what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Dementia is a condition that affects the patient that can be diagnosed quite easily in experienced hands. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the brain that requires a biologic measure to decide whether it's present or absent. Let's now talk about biomarkers. I think you already appreciate that for us to know what's going on inside the brain, we've got to measure the brain in some way. And the typical methodologies we have are brain imaging. Um, the older methodologies involve MRI, and these are ways that I'm showing you through which we can quantify either the volume of different structures in the brain in the lower right, you can see, for example, this purple outlined area, the MRI can measure the size of that area, or here something called diffusion tensor e imaging, which can look at the white matter of the brain and tell us uh, its health. So biomarkers really are biological indicators of what's going on in the brain that can help us decide if the brain is healthy or if it has specific abnormalities. PET scans are an evolved methodology. Uh, they involve injection of a chemical into a vein. This chemical has a particular property. It's really a molecule that's tagged with a little bit of radioactivity. It goes and sticks onto something in the brain. And while it's there for a brief period, it's emitting a little bit of radioactivity that a camera can catch, very much like a CAT scan, except in a CAT scan, the X-rays are sent through you, uh, as opposed to here where the X-ray equivalents, the radioactivity comes out of you for a brief period and allows us in this instance to see a protein called tau in the brain. So brain imaging biomarkers are very important to help us decide what's going on in the brain, but they're also costly and complicated. And if you recall one of my first slides, the vast majority of individuals with dementia are going to be in the developing world where these fancy imaging studies are not necessarily available. So we are more and more looking for blood tests that will compare people with and without dementia. And here's just an example of a blood test we're developing at Johns Hopkins where you can see that people with uh, cognitive disorders have abnormally low values on this blood test as opposed to normal people. So we're increasingly moving to blood tests as a way of telling whether there is a lot of amyloid in the brain, which up until recently we had to use an expensive PET scan. And the next generation of blood tests involve these particles called exosomes. These are little fat, uh, bodies that one can find in the blood, which come from specific brain cells, and we can measure what's inside the brain cells by measuring what's in the exosomes. So the message about biomarkers is that increasingly physicians and scientists are developing ways of knowing what's happening in the brain so that we don't have to rely just on symptoms to make a diagnosis. And this is happening either through blood tests or through different kinds of fancy brain imaging. 
These become important because we now know that large numbers or uh, pretty much everybody who eventually gets dementia has the brain disease that we call Alzheimer or one of its related conditions, there are many, uh, happening in the brain for a long time, perhaps decades before any symptoms happening. So this is the period where the brain disease is active, but the person has no symptoms. We call it a pre-symptomatic phase. And we think that in the context of this pre-symptomatic phase, there is a deposition of proteins called amyloid and then tau to lead to malfunctioning of the brain neurons. These are the cells that make our brains work. And then when enough neurons and systems are lost, you start getting symptoms. And we have two kinds of symptoms. First are what we call subjective memory complaints. Not everybody gets these, these SMCs. Some people do, some people don't. But when the problem progresses, they get a condition called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And in the more advanced stages you see here where there's a lot of brain damage and we've gone down this central cascade, we have dementia, which is this condition that we talked about before. But there's a parallel set of symptoms and these are changes in behavior. We know now that probably well over half of people who eventually develop dementia due to Alzheimer's disease first develop changes in personality, mood, irritability, anxiety, sleep problems before they have memory symptoms. And as this condition might worsen, it might affect their ability to function. And that's what we call MBI, mild behavioral impairment, which when it is more advanced, we call it neuropsychiatric symptoms. So here, what I'm trying to illustrate that we have a pre-symptomatic cascade in the brain, this blue cascade, which has two parallel clinical changes in the patient, some that affect memory and other parts of cognition and others that affect behavior. So by the time you get to the end stage here, which is where we have dementia and neuropsychiatric symptoms, there's a fair bit of brain damage. So the concept of cognitive reserve is really about how do you resist going down this cascade in a way that symptoms either are delayed or don't happen. There's pretty good evidence that a lot of people, especially in very advanced ages, die with the brain damaged in these advanced stages, but with no symptoms. And we think that what is protecting them from getting symptoms is this concept of brain reserve. We'll talk a little bit at the end of the presentation about what you can do to maximize your brain reserve so you don't get symptoms. And in May, we will have a wonderful talk at Johns Hopkins by a colleague from Sweden who will talk about prevention and it's really all centered around this idea of maximizing brain reserve. So the, the way you express this is what you see over here. If you wanna maximize your brain reserve, you wanna stay engaged cognitively, you wanna increase your level of education, have lots of leisure activities, nutrition and social stimulation, and you wanna avoid all of these bad things down here. So that when we talk about prevention, we'll be really talking about ways of maximizing your brain reserve through what you can do and how you live your life. We will return to that. Neuropsychiatric symptoms. As I already pointed out to you, dementia and its related conditions are not just about memory. Pretty much everybody at some point gets one or more of these neuropsychiatric symptoms like delusions or agitation or depression and so forth. This slide basically shows you a study that we did many years back in Utah. And you see over time, the proportion of people who have one or more of these symptoms. So for example, early on in the condition, about 30% have depression, but many years later, close to 80% have depression. So if you count any one of these, you will see that early on about 60% early on have neuropsychiatric symptoms, but by the end of the uh, stages of dementia, 98% have neuropsychiatric symptoms. Why are these important? Because if you have them early on, as this slide shows, if you have what are called clinically significant neuropsychiatric symptoms at the beginning of dementia, you advance to severe dementia much faster, this red line, 
compared to people who have no symptoms at the beginning. And the difference in timing is on the order of two years. So people who develop neuropsychiatric symptoms early accelerate to severe dementia as much as two years faster than people who have no neuropsychiatric symptoms. Therefore, we think of these early on as a way of targeting and delaying progression. And because now we're seeing these symptoms as happening even before the onset of dementia, we're starting to target them as a means of preventing dementia. So a 78 year old, for example, who has a clear change in personality, is irritable, isn't sleeping well, but has completely normal memory, might be in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's and by treating the sleep disorder and the behavioral changes, the personality change with medications, we might actually prevent the onset of dementia. I'd like to talk now about home-based care. Uh, one of the themes that we can talk about in the Q&A is that the likelihood of a cure, one that would stop Alzheimer's or one of its cousins in its tracks, in the next decade or two is pretty slim. There are a number of disease-modifying therapies, as we call them, that are in evolution right now, but these in general uh, are not showing the indication that they will stop this. What that means is that we will have large numbers of people to take care of, and ideally, we'd like to do it at home. So the message I'd like to give you about home-based care is that there's a good paradigm, a good approach. We've developed one at Hopkins, but others have developed them in other parts of the country. And these systematic approaches of clinicians going into the homes of patients can be very effective. So even though we can't necessarily cure these diseases, we can really change their trajectory and improve the life quality of patients. And the evidence that we have accumulated, for example, and I'll just show you some figures, is that people who are uh, receive the, what we call the mind at home, home-based intervention developed at Hopkins, if you receive that in early dementia, you are going to leave from the home to the nursing home about nine months later than if you don't receive the intervention. If you think about it, that's a huge benefit to be able to say, if you are unfortunate enough to develop dementia, by allowing us to come into your home and help manage your chronic condition, we're gonna delay your having to leave the home to go to a nursing home. Similarly, uh, in our early research and later also, we've shown that mind at home, uh, delivery of home-based care will improve quality of life. You can see it here. There are very few studies in dementia where quality of life improves. Most studies, when we intervene, we can show that quality of life worsens less fast, if that makes sense. But here we actually showed improvements in patient quality of life. And we also were able to show that we can change the burden of time that the caregiver has to spend by uh, as much as a dozen hours a week. So that folks who are receiving the mind at home intervention, their caregivers have about 12 hours fewer per week of hands-on care for the patient. Big numbers again, if you think about it. And finally, more recently, we were able to show that not only do these kinds of interventions help with staying at home longer, quality of life, or care burden for the caregiver, they cost less, they save money because they keep people at home, they don't utilize hospital services, emergency departments, and so forth as much. So home-based care for dementia is possible and is going to be the wave of the future, and we're proud at Hopkins to be at the forefront of this approach. What's the future? We're, I already made the point that it's um, turning out that we're not likely to have an ability to modify Alzheimer's disease in the brain so as to cure it in the near future. And one of the reasons we think that's the case is because our field has approached Alzheimer's as if it's a single entity. And in fact, there are probably many different kinds of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. And therefore the search is now on to discover the different subtypes and subgroups of the disease which is what we call precision medicine. Precision medicine is about delivering the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. In this particular instance, it means that we have to discover the subgroups of Alzheimer's disease and deliver the right treatment to the different subgroups, treatments that are specific to each subgroup. 
So we're doing that through our Precision Medicine Center in a two-phased approach. One is a big data approach where we are analyzing hundreds of thousands of medical record data and already acquired brain MRIs, and we're going to develop what's called deep phenotyping. In other words, we're going to start differentiating subgroups, green people, blue people, red people. Obviously, I'm not giving people colors here, but I'm using these symbols to reflect them. And this will allow us uh, to say that for different subgroups, we need to come up with different treatments. But the analyses of medical records or MRIs are just tentative. They're gonna give us a first sense of the kinds of subgroups that are out there to which we can target specific therapies. The next phase will involve taking these proposed subgroups coming out of the medical record data, drawing blood and using very novel biomarker techniques to analyze their DNA, to analyze their exosomes, or to develop their own individualized stem cells. So we will take someone's blood, we will transform some of the blood cells into stem cells. So that's a form of reprogramming. And then we will use those stem cells to create their own individualized brain cells in a dish in the lab, and we will be able to test drugs and know what drug is best for each individual. Again, these are individualized stem cells. Think about you draw my blood and in three months, you've got my brain cells growing in the lab and you can test therapies that are coming out of this precision medicine idea. So in the end, we will have very distinct subgroups. We will have a yellow, a green, a red, and a blue, so to speak. And each of these is going to have a different therapy. This is gonna take a number of years uh, to get from where we are to where we wanna be. But in my view, this precision medicine approach is the future of finding a cure. So what can you do now? Um, we will also be providing you with something that I call a, a tips handout. And uh, I imagine in our Q&A, we'll spend some time discussing this. But these are the, if you will, straightforward, although how to, hard to implement best ways of prevention. One is you gotta stay healthy. That's easier said than done, but if you're overweight, if you're not sleeping well, if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, you wanna manage those as best as you can and as effectively as you can. And in my view, that means working with a good primary care doctor who can help monitor your overall health and address health changes as early as possible. The second is to sleep well. It's pretty well documented now that even a little bit of sleep deprivation accrued over many years can have adverse effects on brain and on memory. So it's important that you try and sleep at least seven hours at night, preferably not more than eight and a half or nine because too much sleep is also not good for you. Sleep hygiene is really critical. This is more about behavior change than it is about medication. So I'm not necessarily advocating using medications to improve your sleep, but in some instances you can talk to your doctor and that might be appropriate. You want to limit the effects of stress. I'm not sure that right now in the midst of COVID, that's something that I can say uh, as something I can expect people to be very effective. But even in COVID, I know a lot of friends and colleagues have used techniques like mindfulness and meditation or stress reduction to limit the effects of stress, which again, a little bit of stress over a long time period, or should I say a little bit of too much stress over a long time period accrues, it adds up. And so to the extent that you can limit it, uh, that is a good thing. Then is what I call the three-legged stool, keeping as physically active as you can with a variety of different forms of exercise. Keeping mentally active and keeping socially active and engaged is very important. I will note that a lot of my patients with dementia in the midst of COVID have not been able to do these three things and they have paid a price. A lot of my patients have worsened suddenly and unexpectedly because they've been isolated in their homes and not been able to maintain physical, mental, and social engagement. Finally, I always get a question about diet. Uh, the only diet that has reasonably good evidence that it's helpful is a Mediterranean diet. Um, and one that's particularly high in antioxidants. There are a lot of 
books that can tell you how to eat a Mediterranean diet. Uh, probably the general way of describing it is rich in seafood, uh, avoiding red meat, uh, olive oil and similar plant-based oils, uh, as much antioxidant and fruit as you consume and vegetables. Um, in my book, that also translates into Greek wine, Greek chocolate, Greek blueberries, and long summers uh, on the beaches of the Aegean or the Ionian Sea for that matter. So with those exciting ideas uh, about how to prevent dementia, I will end my talk and uh, thank you for your attention. And we can now proceed to the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lekesos. It's lovely to have you here this evening and part or this afternoon and uh, part of Alumni Weekend in Hopkins at home. And I say this evening because we will be honest that Dr. Lekesos is joining us from Greece. So he can talk a little bit more about the great Mediterranean diet that he's eating right now. So I'm Betsy Rutherford. I'm a development officer for the Fund for Johns Hopkins Medicine. I do work closely with Dr. Lekesos raising money for some of his research. So I look forward to um, your questions. Keep adding them into the chat. Um, I'm going to start with the most recent stuff. Um, Costas, could you talk a little bit about um, the pandemic? During the pandemic, we're hearing concerns from COVID patients about brain fog and other memory issues. Given that the older population has been more um, uh, impacted by COVID in general, are you seeing any link to Alzheimer's or is this changing your thinking? You're muted still, sir. Thank you, Betsy. That has to be the most common overused phrase in COVID, you are on mute. Thank you, <laughs> Betsy. It's wonderful to be here. I am indeed uh, in Northwest Greece in the mountains, the beautiful city of Ioannina. Uh, it is Easter Sunday for my faith on Sunday. So we may be uh, slightly, hopefully interrupted by church bells because today is the symbolic burial of Christ that will be paraded through the town to, to some extent. Uh, so thank you, Betsy, for the question uh, as well. And I also would like to thank the fund for putting on this, uh, this important event. COVID has in fact been quite impactful. Uh, I already mentioned earlier uh, during the recorded segment of the talk that my patients who already have dementia and are basically shut into their homes have paid a significant price um, because they are not able to be mentally, physically, and actively engaged. So clearly the loss of uh, the kinds of activities that prevent dementia is probably quite uh, meaningful. Uh, but as well, we have recently finished a follow-up study of uh, COVID survivors who came through one of the Hopkins academic hospitals um, and we are in fact seeing that even many months after coming through the hospital, uh, a substantial number of folks, in particular those who came through ICUs, are having uh, measurable difficulties with uh, memory and thinking and other aspects uh, of cognition, which is a little troubling. Um, there are reasons why we're not surprised to see that. Uh, for many people, uh, being very sick uh, with the COVID virus means a very severe inflammatory reaction on the part of the body. And it's very likely that this inflammatory reaction of the body to COVID is affecting the brain of some people uh, so that they might have chronic cognitive complaints uh, chronic psychiatric complaints, and especially if they're uh, older, say in the 70 and older, to be at elevated risk for Alzheimer's dementia. So we're still uh, trying to understand it, but, but we are a little concerned. And of course, uh, we're doing the kind of science that will help us understand it. Thank you. So there's a lot of questions. Please keep them coming. They're great questions. Um, there's a lot of questions in there about testing. And I know you went through the different pet testing and blood markers and all of that during the talk. But can you talk a little bit more? Maybe, um, maybe just what would be the process if you saw somebody that you love that was going through, you were seeing some of the memory issues, but as you mentioned, some of the other issues that come along, the symptoms that can come along, what would you recommend in terms of starting the process? What tests would you recommend? And, and where do you go for this? Where, where do you start and what's your path through? Right, so this can be done in a primary care setting. It can also be done in a specialist's office or in, if you will, an ultra specialized program such as our Memory and Alzheimer's Treatment Center. Uh, the first questions are what I would call purely clinical. 
So if we're seeing someone in their late 70s who's having some memory symptoms, our first question is, is this because they are sitting in their late 70s? There are some changes in memory and other aspects of thinking that we believe are a result of simply aging in that age group. Uh, but if then the person's uh, memory is worse than that, which we determine through what are called cognitive tests. So these are a battery of standardized and normed, normed meaning that we understand how someone of a given age and a given background, particularly educational, ought to be testing. Uh, those will tell us whether the person has fallen off their aging curve. So in other words, are they following a different trajectory than we would expect on these various cognitive tests? Uh, if they have fallen off their trajectory to the extent where it's affecting their functioning, so it's affecting their ability to take their medicines, drive, live independently, that's when we determine that they have dementia. So the first set of tests is clinical, and it's about determining whether someone has dementia or not. Then we get into biologic tests that help us understand what is in the brain that might be causing the dementia. There are rule out tests and rule in tests. Rule out tests are things like straightforward MRIs or brain CAT scans that tell us, for example, the rare instances where what we're seeing, the dementia we're seeing is due to a brain tumor, for example, or a lot of strokes, things that we can see on traditional brain imaging like brain MRI. Uh, we also have a number of rule out tests that are blood tests. They tell us whether the person has thyroid disease. So we confirm that they don't have thyroid disease or vitamin deficiency or kidney disease, all of which could be causing the kind of dementia that we're seeing. So once we're through with the rule out tests, then we have to make decisions about what we call rule in tests. And there we are tracking very specific hypotheses. So we see someone, they determine they have dementia, we rule out all these things that we can rule out. Then we say, well, could this be Alzheimer's disease? And if we wanna know whether it's Alzheimer's disease, there are specific PET scans that we can do to see whether there is enough amyloid in the brain to make that call. We can do similar amyloid probing tests in blood now. We're hoping to have those available in the next couple of years and also in analyzing the, the CSF. Um, so really, the, most of what we do is the clinical tests and then the rule out test. That's pretty routine for everybody. Whether or not we go down the path of the rule in tests like the amyloid PET scans or other tests like it depends on whether we think that will be clinically useful. We don't particularly like to do expensive tests that aren't going to tell us something that will lead us to a particular treatment or to making a particular prediction or prognosis about the patient. Thanks. That's actually one of the questions that's come up is whether or not it's important to understand what specific type of dementia. Um, Andrea in the chat is asking about that. And I know there are many different types. And is it important to know which type you've got? Or can that be done in an in a, um, interview setting with, with a doctor? So uh, it's you, most of that can be done in the interview setting, as Andrea puts it. Um, uh, whether it's important to do is it's helpful to know whether someone likely has Alzheimer's as opposed to definitely has Alzheimer's, because there are some FDA approved medicines on the market that we might recommend or prescribe for someone who we believe has Alzheimer's in the brain causing dementia. But we don't have to have an amyloid test to do that. Based on clinical grounds, we're pretty good at deciding whether someone has Alzheimer's and prescribing these medicines. Beyond that, there are no medicines right now that we would prescribe if we have one of these rule-in tests. Um, the other reason to do these fancy expensive tests, as I call them sometimes, is prognosis. So uh, if someone has mild symptoms, something called MCI, I mentioned it in the recorded segment. So they don't have dementia, but we're not sure which direction this is gonna go. In that setting, knowing whether they have amyloid in their brain is helpful in determining that they are likely to progress pretty rapidly. So there we have a prognosis question, not a treatment question that we might use. The final reason to do these tests is really to, about research. So there are a number of research studies right now that enroll people 
who have an Alzheimer clinical picture plus an abnormal amyloid scan. Uh, and those people, uh, typically the studies for which they would be candidates will pay for those scans. So beyond that though, the tests are largely based on clinical measurement and clin clinical understanding. So um, just to follow up on your, the talk about prescribing, um, Chuck Clarvet asks, how many drugs are you aware of in either stage two or stage three of FDA studies? Oh, I'm not sure I could enumerate that right now. There, there are probably quite a number. Uh, the, the best, what I would do to check that is I would go to clinicaltrials.gov. That is the single best inventory of what's going on. And in the search function, enter dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and that will typically enumerate uh, drugs in trial by phase. And I couldn't tell you offhand what, what they are and how many there are, but there are several. Are you hopeful about any of the ones that you're hearing about? Um, I'm always hopeful. Uh, am, am I hopeful that they will be on the market in the next year or two, possibly? There's a, a drug called aducanumab, uh, the FDA, owes the company that makes it a, a final decision in the next few months as to whether it'll be approved. My personal opinion is that there's not enough evidence to support approval. There was an FDA advisory panel a few months ago that recommended against approval, but the FDA might decide on its own that it should approve. So that's about the closest to market that I see. Uh, I, will, I will make a point though, and I think most colleagues would agree, based on the data we would seen we have seen the likelihood that this drug uh, really changes the trajectory of, uh, of dementia is low. It might change the trajectory a little bit, but it won't stop it. Uh, and the end result of that sort of thing is you just take longer to go down the path. So depending on how you think about it, that might not be such a good thing uh, to delay trajectory of someone who might live much longer in disability. It's a, it's a subjective matter, obviously, for some patients, that's a good thing, uh, but not necessarily for everybody. So what are the basic elements of mind at home, of the mind at home intervention? Is there a way to find that in other states? Um, I, that's always a good question. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit more about mind at home and, and what, what if, if someone doesn't have access to it, what things they might be doing with a loved one? So Mind at Home centers around the idea that what drives progression and what drives bad outcomes for people with dementia is a, a finite set of unmet needs that they might have. So an unmet need might be that they're driving and they shouldn't. An unmet need might be that uh, they are taking a lot of medicine, say, for blood pressure, diabetes, or a heart condition, but due to dementia, they're not able to manage their meds, so somebody else should be doing that. Or another unmet need is that they really have a very inactive life uh, or that their caregiver is not very uh, adept at being their caregiver. So at the center is an inventory of unmet needs, the kinds of things that I said. We, we look at about 50 possible unmet needs. The typical patient when we first see them might have 10 or 12 unmet needs. And we then do care management, working with doctors and a variety of other care providers to help meet those needs. So if someone's driving and they shouldn't, we help them stop driving. If someone uh, has an unsafe bathroom and they're at risk for falling due to dementia, we help them uh, solve that if they need activities and, and so forth. Um, so uh, the, the formula in mind at home is really very protocolized. So that all kind of happens automatically. Someone goes into the home, determines what needs there might be. Then there's a discussion with family and patient, what should be met and so forth. And that is iterated and updated every six to 12 months. Um, the basic idea though is published. The needs assessment that we used is published. So someone can get it, their hands on the Johns Hopkins Dementia Care Needs Assessment and work with their local professional, do a needs assessment, and then look at our publications to see how do you try and meet the various needs. Uh, we are trying to move Mind at Home into several states. We're, we're working with uh, a very large insurance carrier to introduce it uh, to non to outside Maryland. And of course, we're making it available through our memory center for patients that, that we see at Hopkins. And we're increasingly making it available through our primary care clinics from Johns Hopkins uh, community providers. Great. There's, um, I, there's a wonderful array of questions here. You know when you get Hopkins alumni, you're going to get great questions. They're going to be very detailed. So I'm going to kind of 
bring them together. Um, for a typical Alzheimer's medication, if they don't appear to work use and you don't see much improvement, does that mean that it's not Alzheimer's? It may be a different form of dementia. And then um, I'll go to one of your favorite as a follow-up. Um, what about over-the-counter prescriptions? What do you think about them? Things like Prevagen. I know you can't turn on the TV these days without seeing a Prevagen commercial, or maybe I'm watching TV for old people. But um, talk a little bit about um, what happens with a prescribed drug and then what, is, what you think about some of these over-the-counter. So in terms of what's an Alzheimer medication, I, I will start with what I think is implied that these are the FDA approved medicines yeah. like uh, Aricept and, and Namenda. Uh, and it's a tough call to know whether they're working. Uh, uh, sometimes you see immediately patients improve uh, and uh, maybe that's 15% of the time. And for those patients, we will tend to keep the medicines uh, in the long term. Uh, but the other medicines, we will likely uh, try and stop if, uh, if we, the clinicians, along with the patient and the family, really don't think that the medicine is helping, or even if it's unclear that it's helping, but it's causing troubling side effects, then we'll do a trial off, we'll sort of carefully monitored assessment. They've been on the medicine at a certain dose for a while, how are they do off it? And if after a, a week or two or three after coming off the medicine, there's really no worsening then we might well leave them off uh, the medication. Um, uh, so to, to address the other question of over-the-counter stuff, uh, you and I have done this uh, many times, Betsy. I, uh, there's a matter of what's the fad of the moment. Uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we had ginkgo biloba, uh, mm -hmm. then we had coconuts, then we had curcumin. And these are, I think, in, and now we have Prevagen, I think these are derived from from frustration and hope and, and wish to do something in, in a situation that can seem really very devastating to some people. Um, the thing to remember about over-the-counter stuff is number one, the evidence that they work for a diagnosed disease just doesn't exist. Otherwise they wouldn't be over the counter. So typically the advertising will say, well, it's good for memory. And many people will hear, oh, it's good for Alzheimer's, uh, although Alzheimer's is much more than a memory disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other question is, well, what are the risks? Because they too are not assessed. With ginkgo, we had these uh, many years of use, and then it became clear that one in tens of thousands, there were catastrophic brain bleeds, uh, probably related to ginkgo, uh, mm -hmm. to ginkgo. So it's very hard to know that these are likely to be helpful and it's really unknown whether they're safe or not. Uh, so I, my general rule is it's unlikely to be unsafe. If you wanna take the chance, do it. Um, the, the main risk that I think you face is the monthly uh, uh, wallet biopsy that you're undergoing to, to keep these going. So I, 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 don't, I don't do them, go in if your eyes open. Okay, you're breaking up a tiny bit, but um, I'm gonna to go to one of your other favorite questions that we never go through one of these and don't get to is let's talk a little bit about genetics and how much um, Alzheimer's is a genetic, how there is genetic predispositions. Um, I know that the Precision Medicine Center is absolutely looking at this, but can you talk a little bit more about what we know about genetics? Sure, happy to. Uh, I mean, there are different kinds of genetics is the starting point answer. The general question about whether a condition is heritable is best addressed through what are called twin studies, looking at whether individuals who are monozygotic versus dizygotic twins have uh, similar risks. If one gets it, what is the likelihood that the others uh, will get it? And this can be used to estimate an overall heritability risk, which uh, comes down to about 60 to 70% for a condition like uh, Alzheimer's disease. But then it breaks down into a whole lot more detail. On the one end, we have high genetic risks. There is a number of genes that uh, basically mean you will get Alzheimer's disease if you have one of the genes, but that's only about 5% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease have these deterministic genes. Many of them, not all are known. So in the right situation, genetic testing can be done to decide whether a person is carrying one of these genes, these uh, mutant genes. And then there's the other uh, overall risk uh, situation that comes by adding up the effects of many genes at the same time. That's what we call polygenic inheritance. And there's somewhere between 30 and depending on how you count it, maybe 40 or 50 genes that have some 
increase in risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but alone, if you have the wrong type of allele for those genes, you're not determined to get it. That's a complicated area. And now we're trying to address it by what's called a polygenic risk score. So we're trying to put together an additive effect of these 30 genes or so and say, well, here's your polygenic risk profile. If we add up uh, the type of gene you have at all 30 of these loci, what is your particular risk of getting dementia? Still not enough evidence in my view or understanding to use this as a matter of routine, either to predict risk in someone without symptoms or to predict something after they have symptoms. Um, so going to um, pro disease progression, um, uh, Mary's asking about um, if you have a, if she has a, re a relative with no short-term memory, uh, no short-term memory available, but great long-term memory. Does that kind of give you any sense of what the progression of the disease might mean? Um, and I know, it, I, I know I've heard you talk before about there are some types that do come in and progress more quickly than others. Can you talk a little bit about disease progression? Yeah, so it's important to remember that even though most people say it's Alzheimer's, it's memory, that memory is just a part of it. Um, and even though most of the time Alzheimer's disease will first show up with memory problems, in fact, most of the time it will start with behavior problems like anxiety that's never been seen before or irritability or disturbances in, in sleep. So if you're asking me about someone who really has very bad short-term memory, and absolutely nothing else in their behavior, then the next question would be, how are they testing on the standardized tests? And of course, how old are they? Because we, we have different interpretations of test performance for a 75 versus a 95 year old. So it's not really possible to answer the question, if you just have poor short-term memory, what does that mean diagnostically? You've got to do a full assessment and look at the whole package and that is ultimately what helps you, that full package pattern uh, helps you think of what's the diagnosis, what's the prognosis, what therapies might be available. Great. Um, somebody, Liz is asking if dementia is eventually a cause of death. Um, she said she sees an obituary sometimes someone who died from complications of dementia and what does that really mean? Is, is, is Alzheimer's a fatal disease? Alzheimer's is definitely a fatal disease. Um, depending on how you want to determine a cause of death. I mean, ultimately people die because their heart stops or, uh, you know, their brain gets destroyed or uh, that's what's called a prox cause. But underlying that is where Alzheimer's can be so that your uh, disease, the Alzheimer's is so progressed that your brain is basically completely damaged and you are in a vegetative state, you're frail, uh, you can't handle things. Eventually you stop eating or drinking and you can die um, very directly that way from Alzheimer's uh, disease. That's not the common outcome though, as most of the time Alzheimer's affects older people. Older people have a lot of comorbidities. So chances are that someone will die from a contribution of having Alzheimer's, which makes them vulnerable and frail. And then on top of that, getting something like a bad fall with a hip fracture, uh, or a bad lung infection and pneumonia. And so it's the combination of factors that ultimately leads to their demise. And in that case, most of the time, Alzheimer's is listed on the death certificate. Uh, I think the last I looked in the US, it was either the fourth or fourth, fifth or sixth leading cause of death uh, in the United States. So it's right up there. Um, and yes, you can die from it, but more indirectly than directly. So, um, uh... Pam is asking about navigating the anger and denial that comes with the rapid onset of dementia, um, especially with the accelerated dementia. Um, can you talk a little bit about how families might navigate that time? I know we see that a lot in the clinic. Yeah, we do see it a lot in the clinic. Um, I, I will point out that most of the time, dementia is not rapid. So when I'm hearing the word rapid, the first question I would have is, what's the cause of the dementia? Why is it rapid? And, and is it Alzheimer's, which is usually very slow? So I think the way I would advise navigating it is, is go see a good specialist. Uh, there are lots in our memory and Alzheimer's treatment center at Hopkins, but there are lots all over the country and indeed throughout the world, but go get evaluated. Uh, make sure that you know what you're dealing with. 
Are you dealing with dementia? And what is the confidence for that? What is likely the cause of dementia? Uh, if it's rapid, we're not likely talking about Alzheimer's disease, but there are many other explanations. So before you start navigating denial, you need to figure out the facts. And at that point, it becomes a delicate conversation that I've had many times with the patient, with the family, partly informed by the history of the evaluation process where we uh, try very hard to understand the person and how they handle news and what do they believe and, uh, and so forth. And then the other nuance is that a lot of people with Alzheimer's have psychiatric symptoms, depression, agitation, delusions. It's not unusual that they have delusions. So navigating a diagnosis of Alzheimer's in someone who's delusional is very different than navigating a diagnosis of Alzheimer's in someone who's depressed or in someone who just has no awareness of how impaired they are, which is very common in Alzheimer's. People might be devastatingly impaired and have no clue. And it becomes very difficult for anyone to have a conversation with them. Sometimes we might actually not have the conversation with them as a result. So um, that brings me to a, a question that I, I that I get a lot um, is the memory center. It's a combination of neurologists, geriatric um, physicians, and and psychiatrists. Can you talk a little bit more about? Um, and people will see this. They come in, and you are by training a psychiatrist. Can you talk a little bit about why um, why a psychiatrist comes in? I think I feel like most people are very surprised when they hear that. I know, and it always surprises me when they're surprised, Betsy, because. <laughs> Psychiatry is the original brain field. Uh, and, uh, you know, people talk about Freud and Alzheimer. Freud was a neurologist. <laughs> Alzheimer was a psychiatrist, so go figure. I mean, the, the reason that we are doing this is because ultimately it's a multidimensional set of conditions. Uh, and having colleagues from different disciplines who might emphasize brain a little bit more than mental state or frailty, which is what our colleagues in geriatrics do, that's the best mix of being able to evaluate patients, complicated patients, and help look after them for, for many years, because our average patient is with us for half a decade, at least, uh, if, if not longer. Um, so that's really the reason. And, and Betsy, I, I will... Um, just very gently push back with you. I might have started by saying the memory centers nurses. Those yes. the nurses really are the anchor of the program. They are part of the evaluation from the very beginning. They are uh, as much as some of our doctors in the trenches, uh, mm -hmm. taking care of patients, helping families look after them, etc. So the beauty of the memory center is the interdisciplinary nature with different perspectives and on different on these diseases, but also different perspectives on caring for patients with chronic diseases that involve memory, behavior, uh, interactions with people socially, et cetera. So uh, it's an interdisciplinary program and that's why it works so well. Um, and, and it does work so well. It's so much, it's so much fun to be in your clinic and see how wonderful it works. Um, here's one that we, that I have not, it's, I've seen it before and I, I'm curious what you think. Liz is asking about the role of me medical marijuana in dementia. Yeah. So, you know, I, I will, uh, uh, reflect on a moment. I don't, I have no idea what medical marijuana means. Uh, and so I, I'm going to answer it the way I define medical marijuana, but I'll also answer it by what I'm thinking is considered medical marijuana in, in this case. Um, something that's medical as a treatment for me applies a treatment that's gone through a rigorous assessment of its utility for a particular condition and for which the uh, risks for uh, using that treatment is, uh, are known. So there is a, a marijuana in a pill, something called Marinol, which is THC, tetrahydrocannabinoids, cannabis, <laughs> tetrahydrocannabinoids uh, in a pill. Sorry, I'm still a little jet lag. Um, and there is, in fact, uh, some research to suggest that for the subgroup of people who get uh, agitation when they have Alzheimer's disease, Medicines like Marinol or Nabulone, which is the Canadian equivalent or similar to it, can be helpful for agitation. My colleague, Paul Rosenberg, is leading research uh, for us in, in our memory set. Um, what I think we have in recent years is a, is a phenomenon of 
what is referred to as medical marijuana, but is not really medical marijuana in my view, because there's nothing rigorously tested, but it's the availability of various products of the cannabis plant, whether it be THC or whether it be the whole plant or parts of it and food or something to smoke, et cetera. Um, and and that's, that's a whole different issue. Do some of my patients use it? I'm sure they do. I, I hope that they all tell me. I, I'm not the kind of guy who would say, you absolutely must stop or I won't be your doctor anymore. Um, but I want, again, people to be in it with their eyes open. So is there evidence that these various medicinal products that uh, come off the cannabis plant are helpful for people with dementia? No, there's no good medical evidence in that regard. And do we understand what the risks are for using these products uh, in some of these uh, frail older people? No, we don't really because they just haven't been tested. Uh, do I know for sure that they don't help or that they're unsafe? No, I don't know that either. Um, so, and uh, many times there is this sense of desperation and need to uh, find hope. And so clearly some people are driven to use these products uh, in ways that they think might be helpful. As long as they're going into it with their eyes open, uh, I will stand by them if they need my help should they get into trouble, which is not infrequent. <laughs> um, what's the difference between uh, Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's? So uh, Lewy body disease is like Alzheimer's in the sense that it, it refers to a process in the brain. Lewy body disease takes its name from Lewy bodies. These are small proteinaceous, little clumps of protein for lack of a better term, inside brain neurons. Uh, and classically, these were described inside the brain neurons of people with Parkinson's disease. So ultimately, the paradigmatic Lewy body disease is Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's, you see Lewy bodies in a particular part of the brain, the substantia nigra. But there are Parkinson's plus conditions, uh, something called, we call Lewy body dementia, where uh, you see these Lewy bodies throughout the brain. And in that sense, you have proteins damaging the brain, giving a clinical picture that involves dementia and can actually look like Alzheimer's. So it's just another degenerative brain disease that can cause a clinical picture very much like Alzheimer's. I will also point out that, um, and I think I said that towards the end, there is no single brain process most of the time. So many people I see who have Lewy bodies in their brain, they also have amyloid and tau in their brain, which are the proteins that we associate with, with Alzheimer's disease. So these are not clean conditions. So that's, that's a Lewy body disease. Okay, you answered the question because somebody else asked about Parkinson's and I think that's where they were going with that. Um, Molly's asking about if there are um, any good home, home memory tests, that, cognition tests that you could do and then um, with a helper and then administer at home and then return the results to a specialist. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering if the COVID era is getting us to think about this uh, home self test. Uh, there are no that I know of well-validated ones so can someone who has no healthcare experience and no cognitive health experience, can they pull something off the shelf that we use, something called a, like a Montreal cognitive assessment or an MMSC or a clock drawing and do it at home? I suppose they could, I've seen it, it happens. I just don't advise it because there is a lot of nuance to how these should be properly administrated. Families, um, and this has been in situations where we're trying to do the test across a different language with an interpreter. Um, families and even trained interpreters will tend to coach patients uh, because some of the questions might be ones that they really think the patient should know. So what's the year today? Well, I don't know. And so the, the person doing the test, if they're not experienced, might give them clues and sort of go around the purpose of the test. So bottom line, Betsy, nothing validated. Um, there are going to likely be computer administered tests that you can do at home, but you wouldn't be the one interpreting them. The data would go to your doctor and they would work with you to understand what they mean. So we have time for one last question. Thank you so much. You've done such a great job, but um, there's lots of great questions in the, in the chat, but I want to go to one that I've asked you before. So can you talk about whether or not you're hopeful? Where do you stand in 2021 with, um, you have put your entire career into this disease. Where do you stand? What, do you, what is your overall thought and um, 
and sort of hopefulness of, about what's going to happen with Alzheimer's research. Yeah, I, I think this is this is a softball, Betsy, because you know I'm always hopeful. Uh, I, I, yes, I, I am hopeful. I, I'm hopeful for a couple of reasons. One reason uh, that I'm hopeful is that we're really pretty good at helping people right now. And so the challenge there is, can we take these techniques and make sure that we get them to as many people as possible? Mind at home is one way to do that, but it's basically what we know how to do now, especially if we diagnose and catch it early, can be quite effective. We should be doing a lot of it. So that's one reason I'm hopeful. The other reason I'm hopeful is that I feel that we are starting to move away from what I in the past have considered to be blind devotion to the idea that this is all about amyloid. Uh, we're starting to move around and think about other ways through which Alzheimer's might be acting so that we are hopefully going to find therapies that are more specific to the type of Alzheimer's that, that an individual person has. Are we going to get there? <clears throat> fast enough before 2050, when we'll be dealing with a doubling from where we are now in the 40 to 50 million range worldwide uh, to well over 100 to 110 million of people alive with dementia. I really hope we do, but I don't know that we will. So I'm hopeful. Uh, and even if the only thing we accomplish in the next several years is to really disseminate what we know how to do now to as many people as possible throughout the world, that is reason for hope. And we will, of course, always be striving to find the cure. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Lekatos, I'd just like to thank you very much for not only being here today and, and talking to the Johns Hopkins alumni, but as well um, for all of your hard work in this field. It is because of wonderful, dedicated researchers like, like you that I think the rest of us can have some hope for um, what's gonna come. So thank you all for attending. We thank, I thank the audience um, and, Good luck and enjoy the rest of your alumni weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.